Welcome all, and thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. My name is David Robin, your moderator for this first in a series of three webinars on ocean governance and the blue economy in the OECS. The webinar series is part of the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project CROP, which is funded by the Global Environmental Facility with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, as its implementing agency. This first webinar focuses on delivering ocean governance in the OECS and is targeted at persons working in the field of ocean governance and other relevant areas. It will introduce the concept of a blue economy, introduce the principles of good ocean governance, and explain how ocean governance is being delivered in the OECS. The second webinar, titled Looking After Our Oceans in the OECS, seeks to engage students, civil society organizations, and the general public. The third webinar, the final one, will focus on a blue economy in the OECS and caters to high-level policymakers. Information for all the webinars are posted in your chat. As we, the OECS, embrace the exciting prospects of transitioning to a blue economy and unravel the complex multi-level process and arrangements of ocean governance in the Eastern Caribbean, we are ever mindful of our circumstances and context. That is, OECS member states are among the most vulnerable small island developing states and territories in the world. The COVID pandemic has and continues to drastically impact every aspect of economic and social well-being in the OECS. And the ever mindful threats from storms and hurricanes in our region only serve to compound the impacts associated with the aforesaid. Despite our challenges, we cannot and shall not lose hope. So, as part of the whole of governance, government, and whole of society response in OECS member states to the amplified risks and hazards and the unprecedented unprecedented exposures and impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. A blue economy is a foundational building block to support recovery, resilience, re-engineering, and regeneration from our largest natural capital, our marine space. Through the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project PROP, OECS member states are expediting reforms to champion resilient oceans for prosperity crop with a vision for a better quality of life for the people of the OECS. That being said, it is my pleasure to introduce the panel which comprises our key speaker, Professor Dickon Howell, who has over 10 years global experience in bringing together stakeholders at all levels to deliver blue economy solutions in support of sustainable development. Amidst his many contributions in the area of ocean governance and the blue economy, he has directed the de development and delivery of national ocean policy, and this includes delivering the revision of the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and the development of national ocean policy for Grenada, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. 
St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our second panelist is Mr. Mervyn Hastings, the British Virgin Islands focal point for ocean governance and the blue economy, and a member of the OECS ocean governance team. Mr. Mervyn is the senior marine biologist at the Ministry of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration in the British Virgin Islands. He has over 25 years of experience in environmental management and protection, as well as fisheries and coastal zone management monitoring. Our third panelist is Mrs. Susan, Susanna Deboville Scott, project manager for the Caribbean Oceanscape Project, CROP, and possesses over 25 years of experience working in the field of ocean governance, including fisheries management, biodiversity and protected areas, integrated coastal zone management, marine spatial planning, and climate change. I would now turn to some housekeeping matters. Please use the chat box to enter your comments, feedback, and use the Q&A box to enter any questions that you may have for the panel. Questions will be addressed after the presentation. I now invite Professor Howell to make his presentation. Thank you for those uh, kind words of introduction, David. Um, as you've set out, uh, the webinar today is going to address some of the challenges of delivering good ocean governance in the OECS and some of the good practice that's that's already going on. Um, as well as touching on aspects of uh, the blue economy concept and ocean governance, um, we've also uh, included some interview footage from experts within the OECS um, that was filmed as part of the crop project that I think is uh, really relevant to what we're talking about today. It is impossible to directly manage the natural environment Instead, we control those human activities that cause impact to the environment so they can be carried out more sustainably. Good ocean governance focuses on how we manage human activities in our marine space internationally, regionally and locally. So why is good ocean governance important? The ocean covers more than two thirds of our planet and is fundamental to human well-being across the globe. It is the foundation of life and regulates the Earth's climate. It produces oxygen that we breathe and absorbs man-made emissions of carbon dioxide. As well as being crucial to life on Earth, it is also critical to the global economy. Driven by a growing global population and the opportunity for new sources of economic growth, the ocean is becoming an increasingly powerful economic frontier. Estimates of its contribution to the world economy range from $1.5 trillion to $3 trillion a year, representing 3 to 5% of global economic activity, a figure projected to keep increasing. However, there is a balance to be found. The social and cultural fabric of millions around the world and their physical and emotional well-being depends on the health of the ocean. At 2.75 million square kilometres, the Caribbean Sea is a crucial resource for the people who inhabit the small island states of the OECS. More than 1.4 million people in the OECS live on or near the coast, a complex ecosystem that contains the highest number of marine species in the Atlantic Ocean. It is therefore crucial that we manage this ocean space in an integrated and effective manner. I once heard someone say that we very often look at the ocean in the Caribbean as what divides us, but at the same time it can be looked at as what joins us together. The promise of economic growth is accompanied by mounting threats to our ocean environment. These threats are being seen in the OECS, where ocean ecosystems, vital to the livelihoods of many, are changing in ways that will impact current and future generations. 
we have to take environment and social considerations um, along with economic for sustainable development. And therefore, I don't look at this as a juxtaposition, but as a necessary part of the process. So in that light, I see that by achieving environmental objectives, we will also achieve economic objectives within a context of sustainable development. The blue economy concept is about generating wealth from our oceans and seas in a sustainable way. It seeks to promote economic growth, social inclusion, an improvement of livelihoods, whilst at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability. A blue economy is generated by a range of marine sectors and related policies that together set out a path for the sustainable use of ocean resources. Existing sectors such as fisheries, shipping, tourism and coastal development continue to boom, while technology and innovation are opening new opportunities in marine energy, aquaculture, seabed mining and marine biotechnology. We cannot continue, let alone accelerate, human-induced changes to ocean ecosystems. A blue economy moves beyond business as usual to consider economic development, ocean health and social benefit as concepts that can live in harmony alongside one another. It recognises that while some activities depend on the health of the oceans, such as fishing, all have the potential to degrade them. As such, the impact of all human activities on the ecosystem needs to be minimised, or the jobs and economic growth that depend on those living resources will be put at risk. Sustainability needs to be at the heart of a blue economy. The blue economy concept is challenging policymakers to realise that the sustainable management of ocean resources requires an integrated approach to ocean governance at national and regional levels, and collaboration across borders and sectors on a scale that has not previously been achieved. The economies of island nations rely significantly on the natural resources and biodiversity that exists in marine and coastal areas. The aim is for marine economic activity to be in balance with the long-term capacity of ocean ecosystems to support this activity and remain resilient and healthy. Environmental risks and ecological damage from economic activity should be mitigated or significantly reduced. Um, to me, when, we, when I think about the blue economy, I think about um, sustainable oceans. I think about the ecosystem services that the oceans provide. And one of the key ecosystem services is livelihoods as well as uh, food security. And for me, the people component is the most important. And working with the people um, to ensure that they have a sustainable livelihood, for me, is one of the key important in components of a blue economy. Island nations often lack the technical, institutional, technological and financial capacity to sustainably manage their marine resources. This lack of capacity and resource must be addressed in order to allow a blue economy approach to flourish. Having integrated regional and national ocean policy frameworks is essential for this. These policy frameworks will optimise the use of marine space and provide direction for operational decision making for years to come. It's widely accepted by governmental and intergovernmental institutions, industry and society that our oceans must be managed more sustainably. Indeed, in all areas of human society, we must deliver government policy in a more sustainable way. Whether this is through high-level intergovernmental approaches such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals and better management of the high seas, national measures such as marine spatial planning, marine protected areas, effective fisheries management and control of land-based sources of marine pollution, or local action such as community fisheries management or restoration of mangroves, the oceans are high on every policy agenda worldwide. Environmental issues are rightly being considered as fundamental to the sustainable delivery of social and economic policy areas, such as transport, energy, food, security, health, coastal development, mineral extraction, infrastructure development, economic growth, coastal communities, cultural heritage and national security. The challenge for governmental and intergovernmental institutions around the world is how they manage these seemingly competing policy outcomes as efficiently as possible and deliver across as many policy outcomes as effectively as possible. We must not look at that development in silos. We need to make sure that 
whatever development and what economic growth that goes into tourism also trickles down into the man on the ground. And if that is not done, then we'll be able to have an imbalance. So whatever happens within tourism, within planning, they must create that type of balance. Or even the figures must show that tourism brings X amount into GDP. Fishing brings X amount. Diving and snorkeling bring X amount. But how can we increase? How can it all be done sustainably? We also have to look at the carrying capacity. That is very important. So if tourism talks about increasing tourist arrival or increasing um, yacht arrivals, increase of cruise ship arrivals, how does that increase impact on the marine environment? Is it going to be negatively or positively? So yes, numbers come in, but we need to look at the balance in terms of how all of these persons or individuals are going to use the resource and not diminish the value of that resource. Very important. Given that so much of OECS territory is ocean space and that ocean resources are so critical to the region's sustainable development, it's clear that the region's ocean space needs to be well governed to ensure continued benefits to current and future generations. This is particularly true now that the blue economy approach is presenting new blue growth opportunities for the region. Good ocean governance should bring stakeholders together to identify and pursue shared goals and develop a shared vision. It should be ecosystem based and integrated. It should catalyse the negotiation, adoption and ratification of international conventions and enable delivery. It should mobilise strategic partnerships and look to enhance coordination, collaboration, cooperation and participation among key programmes, projects and initiatives. It should be based upon the best available evidence and have clear links from science to policy and decision making. And lastly, it should deliver policy, legal and institutional reforms and recognise that regulation and enforcement are necessary, but the voluntary approaches should also be considered. There are some challenges, yes, in changing from a sectoral approach of doing business to a whole governance, um, whole government, multi-sectoral uh, implementation of ocean affairs. Uh, over the years, we have evolved in working in sectors. Now we have to roll that back to the indivisible um, roles of oceans and its multiple subcomponents. While we were benefiting from the ocean for several years, I do not think that we were we were necessarily thinking about sustainability. But with the coming of the blue economy. I think that um, we have to think about ourselves and we have to think about the future generations. It's just a new paradigm, it's um, a new paradigm shift in the way we manage the ocean in St. Kitts and Nevis. That is, we have to do it in a sustainable way. We are going to explore how ocean governance is currently delivered at four levels, internationally, regionally, nationally and locally. Once we've done this, we'll have a look at marine spatial planning and how this new tool is being used in the OECS to help deliver good ocean governance. There are many international agreements and conventions on ocean governance, reflecting the multitude of human activities that use the oceans. These include UN environmental conventions, international maritime organisation conventions, the sustainable development goals and sitting over all of these, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea which defines the rights and responsibilities of nations with respect to their use of the world's oceans, establishing guidelines for business, the environment and the management of marine natural resources. The SDGs of the UN's 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development came into force on the 1st of January 2016 and included a specific goal for the ocean, SDG 14, focused on fisheries management, marine protected areas and control of plastic pollution. Oceans underpin around 60% of the SDGs, showing we must consider ocean issues across broad policy areas, including environment, human rights, climate change and trade and investment. Given these relationships, addressing most of the SDGs within SIDS requires ocean-related policies and actions. 
the SDGs framework recognises this connectivity between the terrestrial and marine environments, providing an integrated approach to sustainable development. There are several important regional ocean governance mechanisms which sit across different marine sectors, demonstrating the interconnectedness of managing the marine environment. These mechanisms are split into environmental agreements, resource management and a regional security system. However, it is not enough to have single sector policy mechanisms. Integrated regional and national ocean policy frameworks are essential to transitioning to a blue economy. Managing sectors in an integrated way requires a policy framework that allows individual priorities to exist in their own right, but also understands they must coexist in a shared space. The OECS Heads of Government have endorsed a groundbreaking regional policy framework, the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy or ECROP, that recognises the need to ensure the sustainable management of the ocean as the basis for livelihoods, food security and economic development and addresses the challenges facing our ocean environment and the transition to a blue economy. So at the OECS, uh, the sustainable ocean economy or the blue economy is delivered through the implementation of our Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and Strategic Action Plan, otherwise called the ECROP. The ECROP is a document which was approved by the OECS authority, that's the heads of government, in 2013. It is the international best practice for regional cooperation on matters pertaining to oceans. It seeks to deliver in the areas of economic, environmental, and social sustainability. The ECROP was updated as part of the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project to align with the SDG 2030 agenda. It has a vision, principles, policy outcomes and goals and is complemented by national ocean policies at a member state level. The vision guiding the ECROP is the coastal and marine resources of the Eastern Caribbean are sustainably managed to optimise the potential of our natural capital to support a blue economy ensure resilience and adaptation to climate impacts, protect and restore the marine ecosystems of the region, and nurture our natural and cultural heritage for the benefit of current and future generations. The eight outcomes are divided across maritime border and sovereign rights, understanding what is happening in our marine space, protecting the sensitive and precious natural environment, supporting sustainable blue growth, implementing holistic and integrated management of our marine space, increasing the engagement of ocean stewardship of not just those who profit from our marine space, but also those for whom our coastal and marine environments are an integral part of their everyday lives, adapting to climate change, and finally, ensuring that all decision-making is based upon the best available evidence. Sitting under each of these are goals and a 15-year strategic action plan, which ensures that these important regional outcomes are met and that national ocean governance is properly supported. National ocean governance is already occurring in the OECS countries, albeit often as operational management of a particular sector that sometimes integrates with others, such as within marine management areas. When considering how governments function, we tend to refer to policy and delivery. Policy making sets the direction a government wants to take for a particular issue or set of issues, and normally consists of a vision, policy outcomes and goals to deliver those outcomes. Delivery is the operationalisation of this policy and often involves management systems such as licensing or regulation, along with the ability to monitor activity and then enforce compliance if necessary. Sometimes different functions of government are focused more on one part of the system than another. For example, the Coast Guard will focus on at-sea compliance and enforcement while planning control units will focus on the licensing of activity through a set of consents and permissions. It's essential these different parts of the system are well integrated to ensure maximum effectiveness and efficiency. Operational management will often already be in place before an integrated national ocean policy framework. For example, policy frameworks for fisheries, marine conservation, coastal zone management, development planning control, tourism, safety at sea, customs, wastewater and pollution prevention and control are already in place. 
However, these don't often work together in a coordinated manner. There are examples of good integration being carried out locally, such as within the Soufriere Marine Management Area in St Lucia and the Scots Head MPA in Dominica, both of which manage the interaction between tourists, local fishermen, water taxis, the dive industry, yachters, recreational users and the MPA. These local examples of marine management have been put in place out of necessity to safeguard the interests of users and to avoid irreparable environmental damage. So I think it, it all starts with trying to get these people to understand that they have have cultural attachments to those resources. So we don't want to have, in the process of protecting those resources, those cultural attachments are, are severed. So we, we've essentially started doing sensitizations with the different communities, stakeholders, and try to ensure that they, they know why we're protecting the resources. The intention is not to stop them from the traditional use of the area or prevent them from generating a livelihood. The objective is to ensure that their livelihoods continue to exist in the future. Um, we, we don't want to have a situation where we continue Continue to allow them to fish unsustainably, for example, and then we have um, the livelihoods coming to an abrupt end because there's no more fish to fit for them to harvest. We want to ensure that they understand that our objective is to ensure that their livelihoods continue to exist. And, um... Within OECS nations, the challenges to delivering ocean governance are similar, as are the solutions. Collaboration must improve between sectors, institutions and stakeholders. Commitment is needed towards the implementation of international agreements to mainstream ocean governance into national sustainable development. Awareness on ocean governance must be improved across society, from the highest level of government to local communities. Sustained training and capacity is needed to embed integrated ocean governance within national structures. Environmental management, I should say, cannot be done by one department, by one ministry. Because um, when we look at it in a general sense, when we look at the big picture, the environment affects everybody, right? So housing, um, health, fisheries, sports, everybody is involved in it, right? Under the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project, National Ocean Policies, or NOPs, have been developed for Dominica, Grenada, St Kitts and Nevis, St Lucia and St Vincent and the Grenadines and there is a regional commitment within the ECROP for all countries in the OECS to follow this path. The NOPs are closely aligned with the ECROP and establish a national framework for the integrated planning and management of marine activity. Whereas the regional framework set out in ECROP provides direction, the NOPs set out the means to operationalise this direction into national decision making and transition to a more integrated governance approach that ensures the natural marine environment is protected and nurtured for present and future generations. An NOP is a framework policy. It provides integration, coordination and cohesion to a complex national policy landscape. It guides the sustainable planning and development of ocean activities and operational decision making on the ground. It shouldn't replicate or replace other national policy statements for individual sectors, but provide the national framework within which these sectors can work together. Under an NOP, there may well be detailed policy statements for sectors such as fisheries, maritime transport, tourism, energy, climate change, coastal development or adaptation, or energy. An NOP extends from the nationally defined shoreline and includes all marine waters within the exclusive economic zone of a country. An NOP must integrate with other national policies, including climate resilient policies and coastal zone management. This ensures effective integration across the land sea interface and application of an island systems management or ridge to reef approach. So how is an NOP delivered? Well, as with the ECROP, each NOP has a strategic action plan which sets out some key enabling actions to facilitate operational delivery and ensure that the goals are met and ultimately the outcomes are delivered. National Ocean Governance Committees are being established in member countries to provide intersectoral coordination and implementation and oversee ocean governance and a blue economy transition. Across the world, Marine Spatial Planning, or MSP, is used by governments as a way to map the ocean's health and wealth and is particularly important in guiding decision making and reducing conflict over multiple uses such as marine tourism, recreation, biodiversity conservation, fisheries, oil and gas, mining or transport. 
integrated planning is an essential tool for managing a blue economy. Ocean governance is of extreme importance and um, marine spatial management, especially on an island, small, a small island like Dominica, where we have the greatest amount of economic and commercial activity occurring on the coastline. It is important that we be able to uh, zone and to have different areas uh, demarcated for, to, to prevent uh, chaos and user conflict for conservation of the marine resources and for efficient use of the very limited space that we have for, for, for a, 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 an island. So marine spatial planning is of extreme importance. From a fisheries perspective, having to find ourselves that we have to share a, a, an ocean which was traditionally dominated by fishing activities with other sectors such as tourism, um, recreation, and even research, even now the, the, the um, creation and formation of, of, of MPAs or MMAs, some say marine management areas, marine protected areas, but whatever the case may be, now um, these areas, we now have to, to, to accept that special planning is going to be done, has to take place, and, and where do we fit ourselves so that, so that we can have, um, we can cohabit, you know, and co-manage with, with, with other sectors. Most OECS nations are already applying some aspects of MSP through area-based management tools such as designating shipping lanes, allocating fishing areas and implementing locally managed marine areas or MPAs. MSP is not a substitute for single sector planning and management. This is still needed even when MSP is in place. MSP provides direction to reduce conflicts, balance development and conservation interests, increase management effectiveness and address cumulative effects of multiple human uses of the same space. MSP is not just conservation planning. While a network of MPAs might be one outcome, it should seek to balance economic and social development and environmental conservation and not focus solely on one or the other. MSP is not just ocean zoning. Zoning is one way to implement the goals of MSP and has been used to manage individual sectors for decades. MSP does not lead to a one-time plan. It is a continuing, iterative process that learns and adapts over time. The process of MSP is set out in this diagram. Three initial steps set in place the institutional, financial, legal and policy framework required for MSP to be a success and to be sustainable. Ideally, during this initial stage, an NOP is developed to set the policy framework for MSP across all sectors. The next steps aren't a linear sequential process, as there should always be iteration between each step in the MSP process. For example, objectives identified early on are likely to be modified as the effectiveness, efficiency and equity of different management options are identified. Planning is a dynamic process and planners have to be open to accommodating changes as the process evolves. For example, Analyses of existing and future conditions will change as new information is identified and assessed. Although monitoring and evaluation comes late on in the process, one must consider how emerging policies can be monitored so you don't reach the end and discover that this is difficult or even impossible. Evidence is needed to understand economic, environmental and social factors. It is important to understand what economic activities are happening where, how much GDP they create and where the main employment opportunities arise. It is also important to understand how the marine and coastal ecosystem functions and how it may be affected by ongoing or future economic activity. And lastly, understanding how society uses the marine and coastal space is also important. This should include all uses, not just employment, but leisure, recreation, culture, health and well-being. Planning for blue growth involves everyone. We all have a stake in how the ocean's wealth and resources are used. MSP needs coastal communities, fishers, tourism organisations, divers, shippers, the private sector and government authorities to come together and agree on a common vision for our shared ocean space and a blue economy. It is important to engage with these stakeholders early in the process and keep the engagement going all the way through. The more one group of stakeholders understands the needs of another, the more accepting they will be. 
MSP provides a framework for the delivery of integrated marine management. It has to be relevant to the many different decision-making regimes that are delivering frontline management. It does not replace them. The MSP process provides guidance and direction at a macro level to management decisions and articulates relevant national policy outcomes spatially, but does not replace the micro level decision making that is needed within each management regime. In this way, plan led decision making is as important a component of the MSP process as plan development. Without it, the marine spatial plan will never be fully implemented. Good ocean governance provides a balanced and coordinated way to manage competing demands for marine resources through an approach that both achieves the goals of economic development whilst ensuring that ocean ecosystems are sustained and social imperatives are met. The OECS has already shown itself to be a world leader in good ocean governance, a foundation for a blue economy. This is being achieved through the ECROP and the delivery of NOPs, Associated Strategic Action Plans and MSP at a national level. The OECS is also embarking on a coastal and marine spatial planning process that will result in a shared vision for use of the marine environment and guide sustainable development. This approach will allow OECS nations to more effectively drive the triple bottom line of sustainable development, growing economies, protecting the environment and advancing social well-being. I would say that the whole wish list um, of economic goals and the blue economy can only be achieved from the grassroots. I believe that we have to look at individuals. We have to look at a critical number and until we reach a critical mass, um, that is where we're going to see um, that we've achieved um, the sustainable development um, goals and targets. So we must make it relevant to the individual on the ground. If it's not relevant to the individual on the ground, then we would not have achieved anything. When people think of, you know, they ask themselves, have I benefited from this? You know, they're saying, well, you know, have I gotten more food? Um, can I afford to pay school for my kids? Can I do something? And to them, it's only real if the impact or the benefit is there um, in a tangible way. So the we all have a stake in how the ocean's wealth and resources are used. We all have to decide how, where and when we will be part of this new blue future. Only by working together can we secure a sustainable future for our oceans, our nations and our people. David, um, we've had quite a few questions come through um, uh, as, as we were talking. Um, we're going to address those in the panel now, I believe. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Howell, for your comprehensive presentation. But before we move to the panel, I will do the questions and answers, sorry. We will move to having just the perspective from the other two members of our panel, and I would invite uh, Mr. Mervyn Hastings to give his perspectives. Thank you, David. And um, good morning to all colleagues. Um, it's great to see so many people joined in with us here today and this morning. Um, very good comprehensive presentation, Dr. Howell, on ocean governance, marine spatial planning, and the blue economy concept. With that said, however, though, I would like to say I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiments of Mr. Newton, a recent statement during the presentation. It's the people component that is the most crucial aspect of this component. Working with the people to ensure that they, or in essence, all of us have a sustainable livelihood from our oceans. That is, that, that is the underlying reason why we're doing all of this. However, it is very important to note that blue economy may be a term more recently introduced to our technical jargon. But here in the Virgin Islands and in other OECS member states, We've been working for some 20 plus years to strike a balance between ensuring our marine resources remain healthy while reaping optimal economic benefits. For example, if we look at some of our key guidance documents, such as the St. George's Declaration of Principles for Environmental Sustainability in the OECS, which was actually signed in April of 2001, and even many of our national environmental laws or policies, many of them already speak to elements of a blue economy approach, including the establishment of marine protected areas, fostering sustainable fisheries, 
conservation of our coral reefs, our mangroves, and other marine resources, and pollution reduction. Those documents have always been a footprint to a blue economy. So it's not something that we're starting from scratch. We've been doing this for the past 20 to 25 years already. More recently, countries have articulated more if, if, sorry, more recently, countries have articulated more if, um, evidently the intent to a transition to a blue economy. For example, here in the Virgin Islands, we have drafted a Virgin Islands Strategic Blue Economy Roadmap 2020 to 2025. The purpose of this roadmap is to establish a framework that can guide the planning and development of maritime activities in a rational and sustainable manner for the social and economic development of the Virgin Islands. This framework is, is the basis for effective coordination among all government agencies with, with the responsibility for marine time and ocean affairs and a harmonization of national actions in relation to the Virgin Islands and maritime waters. It's based around six thematic areas, namely, one, enabling environment, two, our maritime tourism, three, our fisheries, four, aquaculture, five, marine information and science needs, and six, new and emerging opportunities. So it's very clear that in the OECS and other um, regions around the Caribbean, we are already making efforts into making a blue economy a reality. I mean, one of the things I've always said to my colleagues is that we, we try to think of the Caribbean or in the region of only landmass. In the BVI, we have 153 squ square kilometers of landmass. But in reality, we have over 84,000 square kilometers of marine, of marine ecosystem or marine real estate. That is some 500 times more real estate than our land real estate. So that is why we're trying to preserve and have a blue economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. I now invite uh, Mrs. Susanna B. Bouville scott Good morning to all. Thank you, David. Um, great presentation, Howell. Quite comprehensive and touched on a number of key points. I would just like to reflect on some of your concluding words, and that is, we all have a stake in how our ocean wealth and resources are used. From this, I would like to emphasize that decision-making must be inclusive and transparent, recalling that social inclusion is a key component of blue economy. Mechanisms must be established to ensure social inclusion. In the presentation, you mentioned that countries were in the process of establishing national oceans governance committees to ensure intersectoral coordination and implementation of national ocean policies. It is important that these committees comprise of agencies among, with, among others, mandates for various aspects of ocean govern, governance, including, but not limited to, maritime administration, foreign affairs, fisheries development and management, environmental sustainability, seaports, immigration, enforcement, physical planning, finance, public health, waste management, tourism, and legislative matters. But it is equally important to ensure that academia, private sector, and traditional users of the resource, such as fishers and indigenous persons, have a voice on such coordination mechanisms. Full stakeholder awareness and participation is critical to ensuring credible and accepted rules, in addition to facilitating compliance, minimizing disputes, promoting cooperation, and reducing conflicts. Moreover, it is critical that national grievance redress mechanisms be put in place to address any complaints arising from the implementation of national ocean policies, including marine spatial planning, so that such complaints are brought to the fore in a timely manner and addressed before escalating to the point where good ocean governance and ultimately a blue economy is threatened. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Scott. Uh, now we have in the chat a number of questions and uh, I would like to just address, uh, for us to seek to address those. And one of the questions which is here from uh, Jano Mendia de Sure, hoping 
you will be sharing robust, concrete ocean resource systems, economy cost benefits figures with the Caribbean region, looking at the potential losses if concerted action is not taken. Um, David, can I invite I... the panel to reflect on this, and especially um, our thoughts would be here. David, I'll, I'll go first, if I might. Uh, I think Jeanne raises a really good uh, point in both this question and her next two questions about the importance of natural capital in decision making um, and trying to value the benefits that our, um, our ocean environment gives us, um, not, not just in terms of economic benefit, but also um, environmental and societal benefit. Um, this work is very much in its, in, in its infancy, I think, across, across the globe. Um, but we're seeing it starting to be brought in. Um, I believe in uh, 2018, um, uh, the UK government agency, the JNCC, did some natural capital work in the BVI in Anguilla that looked at the potential loss in natural capital um, from the coral reefs um, in, in the BVI and, and related that to what it would cost, the equivalent cost would be in coastal protection. Um, and they did a similar piece of work in um, Anguilla looking at, at the value of natural capital. Um, this is something I think that needs to be considered as we move forward over the next decade and I have no doubt it will become a greater part of our decision making as we get more robust methodologies to be able to um, use it effectively. Thank you Professor Howe. There there's another question, and this pertains to sargasm. I would like to pass this one to um, Mrs. Scott. How does sargasm management fit in with the regional Caribbean blue economy strategy? Sargasm is, a, is, is an issue that um, we've been battling with for a while. And it's important that could I'm sorry, um, there was a, an echo on, on my end. Um, it's important that countries um, look at this as a, a blue economy opportunity. Um, while it has its threats in terms of, 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 of the tourism industry and fisheries, etc., cetera, um, if we are to really approach the, the management of Sagasam in a way that can contribute to econ the blue economy, for example, we have persons harvesting uh, um, this for um, the use of organic, uh, as organic fertilizers, et cetera. Um, it can contribute to, to the blue economy in, in, in this manner. Of course, we also have to look at issues related to harvesting methodologies and ensure that these are, are being done in, in, in a sustainable um, a manner, recognizing that we've noted that some key species tend to, um, especially juveniles, tend to be associated with these cigars and patches, etc. But if we are um, devising uh, um, systems that ensure the sustainability of our fisheries and um, uh, ensure that we can collect an, um, um, this sargassum and, and use it in a sustainable manner and um, in an efficient manner that can contribute to the economy, I think is, is the way we need, need to go. But recognizing also that this is a phenomenon that has come about in, in, in recent years and um, it is not clearly understood as to if, if one or, the, or several factors um, um, causing it and it is something that has happened over time and something that will disappear over time and so that when we're investing in, in, in these types of um, 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 ventures, we, we need to have a, a full understanding of, of the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and this other one uh, would be directed to um, Mr. Hastings. Can the draft BVI strategic roadmap 2020 to 2050 be used as a tool 
to move forward a mainstream sustainable ocean-based economy in light of COVID-19? If so, can this plus the revised ECOP be used to help the BVI to leverage and ultimately attract funding to move forward, possibly through the current EU resembled request for proposal. Yes, thank you very much, sir, David. I think I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, let me say, in saying that, though, don't forget, um, it's still a draft, which means that it still has to pass through um, the cabinet procedures here in the Virgin Islands, which um, will be either my ministry or the Premier's office will be pushing this draft paper through. And once passed, um, the document um, will be shared amongst, obviously, the OECS mem member states and, and the world because it'll be, it'll be a pub public document. And being, being, being an associate member state, we are, we are very much involved in the, in, in the EQA. And I think as, as Mr. Jonathan McHugh said, um, it, it might be a good, good way to attract additional funding as well. And don't forget, we also have a climate change policy and a climate change trust fund, which we've established, which we're actually hoping to get more funding into that can be used towards the blue economy. Um, and very quickly, what is the potential of this modeling for the OECS? And uh, before you answer this, I would inform that we are currently going to be launching a poll and we'd be grateful if you can also um, attend to it. It would appear on the screen. Mr. Hastings, can you continue the answer then on the importance of this, of upscaling to all of the OECS. Well, as one of the presentations in Dr. Howard's um, talk said, we have to think ourselves, regionally, we have to think ourselves as one ocean. We, anything that affects us in the Virgin Islands will affect Anguilla and our, our neighbors, the Virgin Islands. Anything that affects Anguilla is going to affect St. Vincent and, I mean, Antigua, and it, it goes down the line. We're actually one ocean. So, obviously, anything we can share and we can do. We're all one ocean, we're all one economy, and we're, we're all gonna benefit from this blue economy. Uh, we all share the same tourism. Um, our cruise industry, which is a major, major, major economic benefit to this region, not only stop in the Virgin Islands. They come to St. Vincent, they come to St. Lucia, they come to Martinique, they come to um, Anguilla. So it, it's gonna be a benefit to everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there is just for a matter of um, now looking at perhaps uh, the issue of this continued integration. Um, perhaps then, um, Professor Howell, you did mention it, but can you emphasize how does a national ocean policy work alongside existing more established policies like fisheries or intercoastal zone management? Um, yes, thanks, David. Um, I, th I think it's really important to um, recognise, and I think, I think Mervyn said this earlier, that, that um, we're not starting from scratch anywhere. Um, you often hear this phrase about transitioning to a blue economy. In, in, in most SIDS, the national economy is already a blue economy. Um, in, in terms of the sectors that, that they have. Um, the, the emphasis here is on um, taking that uh, business as usual practice and doing it in a more sustainable way. So it, in the same token, what we don't want to be doing when you're putting a national ocean policy in place is uh, rewriting every single policy statement that, you, that, that a nation may have in place and, and has been operating effectively. Um, the national ocean policy is that framework policy that is pulling together um, the uh, other policy areas that touch on the ocean, um, regardless of, of whether they sit in uh, energy transport fisheries or any, any of the other areas that, that we've talked about. Um, so taking those outcomes, building on them where, where, where necessary, strengthening them, 
with regards to their sustainability. Um, and uh, when we talk about those enabling actions, putting those enabling actions in place to be able to deliver in a more integrated and effective way. And I think it's also worth noting that there is no one size fits all for this. Um, there are some SIDs that have decided to set up ministries of uh, blue economy or ministries to address the ocean. There are other SIDs where responsibility for the national ocean policy sits, in, um, uh, sits within uh, planning. Um, there are other SIDs where it sits within environment. Um, what, what, what is important is that the delivery functions that sit underneath them, so those people that are responsible for either management on the ground or compliance and enforcement or monitoring either of the natural environment or human activity, um, are working together in an effective and coordinated way. And that is what an NOP is setting out to do. Okay, so David, I'm sorry, through you, um, the, the second poll question is not complete on the screen. So I'll just read that out so persons can um, complete that um, particular question. Marine spatial planning is the process of analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal distribution of human activities in marine areas to achieve the ecological, economic, and social objectives that have been specified. This can be applied at a local, national, or regional scale. Have you ever participated in such a process in your country? Yes or no? So it's basically asking if you've been a part of marine spatial planning in your country. Yes or no? Back to you, David. Thank you very much. And with that, um, how could the St. George's Declaration be strengthened to build on steps taken to date to more boldly reflect comprehensive human security dimension of blue economy. Example, equitable access for all people to blue economy benefits and critical role of governance to proactively restore, protect, and cultivate these benefits for future generations. Given that the largest natural capital of the OECS member states is the ocean space, the St. George's Declaration and the revised St. George's Declaration for the Principles of Environmental Sustainability, the SGD 2020, have as their foundation island system management framework from the highest ridge to the outer limits of the exclusive economic zone. The SGD 2020 embraces principles, outcome, goals, and enabling actions that are aligned to the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and Action Plan and Strategic Action Plan, and to the National Ocean Policies and Strategic Action Plan. And these very quickly include environmental stewardship, so we will all be taking care of the space ourselves, the stakeholder participation, intergovernmental, uh, non-governmental, governmental stakeholders, all of them, the use of sound science and best practice, the application of the precautionary principles, environmental sustainability, access and benefit sharing, transboundary cooperation, good ocean governance, and gender equity and inclusiveness. In all of this, the outcomes that we will have from these frameworks would then allow us to be able to significantly look at how we can best enhance our deliverables embraced by the St. George's Declaration. We do have another question. And this one, I shall read. There has been incidents of bullying from cruise industry over the years 
in the wider Caribbean region. This was discussed as far back as 2004, and the, the, through the UN GPA white paper and the Caribbean process for countries where they were unanimously afraid to speak out as a bloc. The question before us then is, is the OECS as a bloc willing to be able to stand together if necessary to the powerful companies that have interests and move this to advancing equitable blue economy benefits? In this question, it recognizes that there is an imbalance in the relationship between the cruise industry, which is very powerful, and there it also recognizes the fact of our geography and our geographical advantage, where 40% of cruise, the cruise trade is in the Caribbean, but the Caribbean offers a unique situation where we are able to have cruise ships traveling from one country to another overnight, unlike anywhere else in the world. In this regard, what has happened is that all of our countries in the OECS and in the wider Caribbean, which offer international shipping registration, they have also Im implemented the International Maritime Labor Convention and are applying this as a measure to ensure that bullion on board ship in terms of the human element is dealt with, but more so, we also recognize that ultimately there is the need for a conversation to address the imbalanced relationship so that there can be benefits for the cruise industry, there can be benefits also for the member states participating, and as well that the impact on the environment on the member states can be balanced and we can have the necessary resources put into ensuring that there is sustainability. I note from our poll that 87% uh, of the persons answering had some basic idea of uh, uh, ocean governance and blue economy that 91% uh, had some exposure and involvement with marine spatial planning, and 73% thought that the webinar was helpful. Uh, we thank you very much. We would end the poll here. We are at the time where we need to close. And uh, with this, fundamentally, I would just like to say of our thoughts concerning the future of the blue economy in the OECS. I think the ratio of our marine space, our marine endowment to our land, make our circumstances one which prescribes and loudly states that it has to be in part of our process going forward for development than that with the work which has been started and with all of the activities and more lately with the revised Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy, the extension not only to the states which have participated, but to all of the OECS member states means that there can be a brighter future. But fundamental to all of this, we are all called to stewardship, which is one of the principles of our blue economy moving forward. We all are in this together, and I think we can have a bright future. With this, I thank you very much, and I bid you and remind you that there is a second webinar on the 17th of this month and our second webinar will be dealing with
looking at our oceans in the OECS. And this would seek to engage students, the civil society organization, and the general public. This means that we are not keeping it in the silo. Thank you very much, and I bid you a good day.